Introducing Dennis and Steve. Dennis Warnicke is Director of Sales and Technical Support at Taneo Biologicals. With over 25 years of experience in biological agriculture and turf management, Dennis is highly respected for his expertise in biologicals for both organic and conventional agriculture in a wide variety of crops. He believes in working with nature to grow healthy soil, plants, and food. And right now he's clicking through my, my talk. <laughs> Steve Becker is a Chief Science Officer at Tanio Biological and is afforded an up-close personal view of the world of soil oh, yeah. Not yet. Okay. information that he uses in the development and refinement of Tanio products. After working with Bruce Tanio, we've developed a deep respect for nature, farming, as well as plant and soil microbiome, which is what he, um, which has become what he studies, shares, and develops inputs for. And I'll hand it over to you, Dennis and Steve. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry, Rochelle. We're, we're chatting in the background, having having way too much fun. You're throwing me off. <laughs> Sorry. You're good. Hey, Dennis, but it's me. Uh, so yeah, we'll we'll kick right into ours. Uh, a lot of information, Lackey. Thank you so, Lackey. Th thank you so much. Excellent introduction. Um, so. Let's get started. I'm Dennis. I'm Steve. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. I'm going to try to not speak too quickly, but no guarantees there because I have a tendency to fly through. Yeah, so 30 years ago when I met Bruce Tinio, I was just so impressed and amazed of his understanding of the soil system and the need for the diversity within that soil system, really what we're talking about here today and how important that was to over all soil health. Bruce used to talk, if we took care of the soil, the plant would take care of itself with just a few foliar corrections. And the plant secondary genome known as the plant microbiome is really what is important here. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's taken decades of research to finally come to a better understanding of what's actually going on. So the research started off with the human microbiome project because, you know, people are worried about people. And there's a lot of money that's been dumped into it to help uh, highlight and give a better understanding of what's going on. So through that research, they've discovered that humans, we've got about 30,000 genes that are up and running. The microbes on, in, and around your body, a million genes. When we talk about our cells, there are roughly 10 trillion human cells. There are 100 trillion microbial cells on in around your body. So you've heard people say that if aliens came and took a look at us, they think that we're mostly microbes and that's really kind of how it is. So that research has shown how critical these microbes are. And we see that these microbes are different in different parts of the body, the mouth, the armpits, the feet. And I mean, honestly, it's easier to tell the difference between Dennis and I based on the microbes that we see on our hands and our skin. So the research has also led into the plant's secondary microbiome, and we see just how critical and important that is as well. So that's what we do. We utilize scientific information and research to help build our products and build our programs. So some of that research that we're gonna to use today is the research that is done by Dr. Hatfield, who focuses specifically on the soil degradation spiral, as he refers to it as. Um, poor land management, he talks about, I look at it as basically agricultural practices. Agricultural practices, you know, herbicide use, tilling, all the things that Lackey talked about that we need to get away from are exactly what has set us into this degradation spiral. And so that led to aggregation, degradation, crusting, um, compacting, wind and soil erosion, and then down to plant growth. The most important part of this is how does this all affect that soil biology? Um, obviously, throughout all of this degradation cycle, we've the biology has struggled. We've lost the diversity that we need within that soil environment to have a healthy biological system. As Bruce talked about, if we take care of our soil, the plant will take care of itself. So with that being said, when I generally look at the aspects of a establishing or evaluating a new field or a new environment, I look at the grower needs to do these exact same things. We need to know the history, the history, uh, the herbicide use, the management practices, crop budget, all of those types of things. So we have an understanding where we were and where we want to go. We look at, as Bruce always said, test, don't guess. 
The soil analysis, tissue analysis, sap, leaf extract analysis are all critical for us to make our decisions. As I say, building soil biology also takes healthy plants that we'll hear a lot about in this presentation today. We need to get out and evaluate that field. I say nutrient excesses can cause a greater problem than deficiencies. Deficiencies are easy to correct. We need to understand our water quality and how that uh, affects the microbial community within that soil environment and the carbon to nitrogen, plus many more. But these are some of the main things that we wanna take a look at. So in the soil aggregation climb, this really what we come, uh, come to talk about in regenerative agriculture is how do we build it back up? And this research done, uh, done by Dr. Hatfield, the laboratory director for the National uh, Research and Agriculture, I mean, this is what he spent his life doing. Decades. Decades doing this. And so he found that biological activity was the foundation of this stair step to make the stair step climb. So we'll talk about how that biological activity functions in each part of this different stair step climb as we build regenerative agri uh, agriculture. So his, we're breaking it up into five parts, into the biological activity, organic matter turnover, improved nutrient cycling, improved soil structure, and improved water quality. On the first part, the biological activity, we're going to mainly focus on inoculums. How those inoculums can help us get to where we want to go today and build each of the components in this five-step program of the stair step of the ladder. So with that, Dr. Hatfield's research, and I really want to emphasize this, is what he found was adding biology in every instance increased all aspects of microbial response. And it goes back to the idea of diversity within that soil environment, what Bruce had talked about 30 years ago. We can alter the biological activity in our soil. We can feed the biological based on how we feed it we determine and support that biological activity. And preliminary results suggest that, you know, we can make that change in as little as three months. And over nine months, we can make larger changes. So let's get started on this bottom run, the inoculum. Let's get this foundation laid and how inoculums can help us in regenerative agriculture. So the big part is the benefits of biology. Today, Steve and I are mainly gonna focus on the rhizosphere and the rhizoplane surrounding the root and the root surface. But we have to remember that beneficial bacteria biology is in the flower, it's in the fruit, it's in the stem, it's in the leaf, it's within the tissue of the plant, and it is surrounding the seeds. And everything we do in our fields has an effect on this biology. And we have to understand how we're affecting the biology in every process of agriculture that we do today. So with that being said, let's get started and talk a little bit about the rhizosphere and the rhizoplane. Yeah, and Lockie had some great pictures of showing the same thing. We like to call these dreadlocks, but this zone directly attached to or associated with the root is what we call the rhizosphere. Rhizo means root. So this rhizosphere, rhizoplane, is a place where the microbes want to build their homes. There's a lot of food there due to exudates, and there's a lot of nutrition exchange going on there. So a lot of the microbes that we're talking about are known as plant growth promoting rhizobacteria. Rhizo means root again. So these are bacteria that live on and around the root. And we see a wide diversity of different benefits associated with those beneficial microbes. They're basically broken down in two groups, direct effects and indirect effects. The direct effects are generally associated with nutrient acquisition, growth and development, phytohormone production as well. The indirect effects are broken down into basically abiotic, non-living stresses and threats, such as drought, and biotic or living threats that the plant has to survive through. To be a PGPR, it's kind of this club, and to be in this club, you have to have some certain characteristics. So you have to check off the box. So you have to be able to proficiently colonize the root. You have to be able to survive on that root. They must survive, multiply, and compete with other microbiota. So this is basically the, the, what they have to be able to do is survive there and compete there. They have to live. And then finally, duh, they have to promote plant growth. They're plant growth promoting rhizobacteria. So we have to have a benefit from them. So that's what you have to do. You have to be able to survive in the root and you have to create a benefit for the plant. 
And the plant is purposeful on how it does this. John's going to talk more about um, plant exudates and maximizing photosynthesis. Um, but what we're seeing is as we maximize that photosynthesis, we get a difference in what we have going on in our soil through our exudates. We used to think that our exudates and our nectar was just basically sugar water. That's not the case. This is a very specific mixture. This is a tonic that the plant produces to attract in or recruit different beneficial species. So plant roots secrete a wide range of compounds. And I'm going to focus real quickly. There are a lot that's going on. And again, these are specific. These are recruitment tools or protective tools that the plant utilizes. So malic acid, for example, attracts in bacillus subtilis to the root zone. Here you can see research that was done. What the researchers did is they threatened this plant with Pseudomonas syringii. They wanted to put a disease in the environment. And then they wanted to see what happened. So they monitored as this plant increased its malic acid production, and then its exudates were heavy with the malic acid. And this malic acid attracted in and encouraged the growth of Bacillus subtilis. And you can see here where the uh, researchers made it so that the Bacillus subtilis would glow. So their plant is under threat and specifically recruiting the organisms that it's going to help. You know, it's it's kind of like I refer to as sending out the bat signal, see? Absolutely. If you have bad guys in your neighborhood, and you need help and you put the bat signal out, you want Batman to come take care of the bad guys. <laughs> if Batman doesn't see that signal or he's not there, then that call goes unanswered. You don't get the bam, the pal, the zap that we used to know from Batman to take care of the bad guys. <laughs> I mean, that's what we're talking about here. Yeah, and it's, it's multiple. We have a wide variety of impacts that we see. This bam, pow, zap. So for example, researchers working with corn saw that Corn will produce benzoxazenoids to help protect it. It'll protect it. It'll send that throughout the plant, but it also sends it as an exudate. So this benzoxazenoids, they're antibiotics. They help shut down growth of pathogens. And you'd expect them to shut down the growth of other living organisms. They're antibiotics. But what the researchers found is these or this uh, benzoxazenoids actually attracts in different organisms. In this case, Pseudomonas putida. It attracts the putida in, so these molecules of plants producing help protect it, help recruit beneficial organisms that, again, help protect the plant from further attack. Pretty incredible. It really is. And in each one of these processes, again, we're going to talk about how biological inoculums help us reach each stair step on this ladder mm -hmm. and continue to climb. So the next one is organic matter turnover, carbon, dead microbial biomass, and root exudates, and how important that is. So we look at that based on an active protective blanket and also a path, passive protective blanket. You know, we talk about the root exudates and this cover crop of this nutrient cycling, but the really important part here when it comes to the inoculums in the biological community is that protection layer that it gives, whether it's a active blanket or a passive blanket. Remember, biology needs food, water, shelter, and a home. When we have bare ground, we don't have any of those for that microbial community. So with this passive blanket, not only are we giving the food, we're supplying oxygen, we're retaining moisture, and we're basically buffering the temperatures within that soil environment to keep that biological community alive. With that being done, now this biological community can start breaking down this protective blanket and create the humification process. And that's exactly what we wanna see. So this passive material, it provides all of those benefits you just mentioned, but we have to do something with it. We've been in fields where you can see years of material. You can tell the last three, four, five years in some cases of what that farmer has grown. And that's a strong indication that they have a lacking digestive system. The soil is not processing right. So what we're supposed to see when we have these beneficial organisms associated with the soil is a process called humification. And this is the production of soil. This is the production of humus. Everybody's heard of humus. It's that great dark stuff that builds our soil. But to get there, we have to have a diversity of different species. So we have fungi that are attacking the more complex molecules, the lignans, and we have bacteria that are working on those as well, but generally focusing more on the smaller molecules. So this combination of bacteria and fungi is what helps break down our plant residues into humic substances. And that's where we get the transition from passive blanket to actual soil. 
The other side of that is the active blanket that we see. And in that case, we're talking about the exudates that the plant is producing. John's gonna focus more on how to maximize those exudates. And Lockie already told us how important they can be. So huge quantities of carbon. And remember, we talked about these can be specific. These can be recruitment tools that the plant uses. Research shows that about 25% of all of the energy, all of those photosynthates the plant is producing straight downstairs and out of the roots as those exudates. Some research shows during certain stages, 75% of the plant's exudates can go down um, to the roots. And what really amazes me is these seedlings, young seedlings, tiny baby plants that are just trying to eke out a living are still sending 30 to 40% of all of their energy, all their fixed carbon down and out to get this microbial carbon pump running. And that's, it's so important because for a long period of time, we thought that decaying plant matter, decaying roots, field debris was the main uh, component of stable carbon within the soil environment. But as Bruce talked about years ago, if you wanna build soil health, build that microbial uh, community within that soil, to build stable carbon. And it's starting to evolve research towards that, that dead microbial biomass and microbial residues can contribute even more significantly to the stable carbon pool. These organisms can grow, live, and die at an extremely rapid pace. And organic matter can be much larger than previously thought by this microbial pump. And there's a lot of different ways they do it. Yes, yeah, so one example of that that I find kind of fun is we just think about the body of the microbe. They live and then die and then they deposit a little bit of carbon. But microbes, they're not dumb. They know what the environment is and they can sense if carbon's going to be limited, they wanna have a surplus of it so they can continue reproducing. So in this example, Pseudomonas putita produces polyhydroxyalkoanates, PHA is what it's known as. And these are basically bioplastic. You can see these little beads, and this is a biological carbon fixation where the, the biology is taking the carbon from the exudates and from the soil environment, building it into itself and creating a reservoir, creating a pool so that it can continue uh, growing and reproducing. But as Dennis just said, these microbes live and die very rapidly. So if they die and they have all these bioplastic beads in them, we have greater deposition of carbon at a faster rate. Pretty incredible. And that can also lead to better nutrient cycling. Yeah. So what we've talked about so far in the biological activity and the organic matter turnover, these are invisible and very dynamic processes that we really don't see. Now we're getting to start to move into what we call the visible outcomes with the improved nutrient cycling that can be invisible, but also visible, and then move into the improved soil structure and water. So let's talk about how important this improved nutrient cycling is and how it happens with that biological community. So a lot of times I love this slide because it talks about the soil, the foundation and nutrition, and that's really why we're in regenerative agriculture, to create healthy soils, healthy plants, healthy food, for healthy humans. That's, that's what this is all about. But when we start to think about it, everything that's in the soil that the biology needs based on the N, P, and K, but how important those trace minerals are, not only to those microbial bodies, but to those enzymes and those enzyme cofactors to help make nutrition available, then is able and made available to move up into that plant. So therefore what through that dead microbial biomass and through digestion within that soil environment and enzymatic processes, releasing nutrition into that plant in a, or into the soil in a state that the plant can use it. This is carried on into the fruit and then on into the human body. This, this system is just so amazing. Oh, it, it definitely is. And Bruce used to talk about, he, he said, soil microorganisms are the key link between mineral resources and plant growth back in the 80s decades ago, and it's taken decades for the research to finally catch up to have a better understanding of what's actually going on. Uh, here, pu published in 2018, uh, the work by Dr. White on the rhizophagy cycle is just incredible. So we understand that these microbes are very good at extracting nutrition. That's basically their job. And the plant itself, not really very good. It only can suck things up that are in the, the water profile. So if we're feeding in a salt-based fertility program, we're not doing the job right. When we actually are building a biological community to digest the food for the plant, what we see is these microbes consume the nutrition out of the soil 
and they're growing around that plant root. We talked about the exudates, we talked about recruitment. So the plant is purposely sending out a bunch of sugar, sending out a bunch of energy for these microbes to grow. The microbes are very happy, they reproduce like crazy and they soak up massive amounts of nutrition from the soil. But then something kind of funny and weird happens during this process. <laughs> the, the tip of the gro growing root, we kind of think it's solid. In reality, it's kind of like a mesh, it's like a sieve. So these very fastly reproducing microbes that are full of nutrition make their way into the plant. And then the plant gets kind of nasty with them. It starts blasting them with reactive oxygen species, which start ripping apart their cell wall. That makes the microbes swell up and get leaky. The plant then basically squeezes them out like a sponge. Some die, oh well, more nutrition. The ones that survived are now exhausted of nutrition, exhausted of nutrients, very, very hungry. And the plant purposely moves them out to root hairs without these microbes being spat out in the root hair form we wouldn't have the same root hairs. And we'll see that a little bit more here later. So here's a fun example. Dr. White has incredible pictures. Uh, so here we can see Bacillus amelolucophaceans and this white arrow, and this black arrow, these are both Bacillus amelolucophaceans. This black uh, spot, the darker spot is when this microbe has more recently entered the plant. And then after it's been attacked and bombarded with these reactive oxygen species and partially digested, here you can see it pointing to the swollen state where these microbes are ready to be squeezed out and then spat back out. And then that's, this is where it happens. This, in this case, Micrococcus luteus is right here. This is a growing root hair. This is the bud of a root hair. And you can see that the plant has more inside and it's spitting them out into the environment to keep this nutrition cycle going. Uh, and Dr. White took this a little bit farther. He took some tomato seeds and sterilized them. So they didn't have any of the microbial communities associated with them. Then he inoculated some of them with the Micrococcus luteus again to see what would happen. In this case, the tomatoes that were sterile, they look unusual. That root doesn't look normal. It's getting black and that's because it's expecting there to be microbes. It needs those microbes. So it's producing those digestive materials to help break those microbes down. But since they're not there, it's actually damaging itself. Without the microbes, this seedling will likely not survive. And we can see here, it's hard to tell, but this black arrow is pointing to the inoculated tomato seeds and it's a little fuzzy around the edge. Those are all root hairs. In this case, the plant is able to function normally. Without those microbes, we do not have normal root growth development. We do not have the root hairs and that plant has a great amount of difficulty actually surviving. So I have this little silly picture here. It's a tomato that looks like a farmer because that's what they're doing. These plants are farming the microbes. They're purposely growing a crop, raising that crop and then consuming the crop. And through that recruitment, through those exudates, it's purposeful. One step deeper, Dr. White took a look at some of these organisms and we always see pathogens in our soil environment. They're always there. We can do a lot of things to try to get them out of there, but that's not how nature works. There's always going to be diversity unless we really mess things up. So there are gonna be pathogens there. Dr. White looked at some of the pseudomonads and found that these pseudomonads that are being spat back out in the environment as part of the rhizophagy cycle, they'll actually infect some of the potential fungal pathogens and they repress their growth and reduce their virulence. Virulence is basically severity. So the idea, the way I think about this is like these fungi potentially have a knife or a pick that they're gonna stab into the plant and start eating it. These microbes infect them and they take away that blade. The, the pathogens are still present but they're not going to cause infection and harm. Yeah, and I see that so often, Steve, with the growers that I speak to on a regular basis. And, you know, it comes to mind of an asparagus grower that, that chatted with me about the idea that he had fusarium and he was a seed producer. And he talked about how he could not have, his seed was tested for fusarium and he had to make sure it wasn't there in his, in his seed production. And he said the fusarium was there in his soil at very high levels. But based on his agricultural practices and his plant nutrition and, and how he took care of that plant, it never expressed itself actually within the plant. So he never had problems with that. And that's just one example. I could give you hundreds of examples <laughs> of, of how this happens on a regular basis. We know that disease pathogen is there. It's just how does it express itself? What does it do? How does it react? Yeah. And we can also focus a little bit deeper on, we talked a little bit about these microbes being sucked into the plant. There are specific microbes being attracted. 
I like to think about these microbes. I mean, if you look at them, they're little spheres, they're little rod shapes. They look like pills to me. So I like to think about these microbes as supplements. And through the rhizophagy cycle, we can really truly think about them that way. So if the plant needs phosphorus or needs nitrogen, which we're going to talk a little bit more about, it can attract in through recruitment specific organisms, then feed those organisms. So in general, these pills, these micro pills are roughly a 10 to 2 plus traces through this rhizophagy cycle as they're being consumed. If we have a nitrogen fixer, that N's going to go up. If we have a phosphate solubilizer, the P is going to go up. We have potassium mobilizers. We have different organisms that will extract and hyperaccumulate trace minerals. So these microbes are great at extracting nutrition from the environment. Nitrogen is a good example. When I say nitrogen and I say microbes, most people think about rhizobia. And that's a great thing to think about. Rhizobia associate themselves with legumes. And the legume creates a special little house for them uh, called the nodule. And the reason that it does this is the nitrogenase enzyme that's responsible for nitrogen fixation is extremely sensitive to oxygen. If it becomes exposed to oxygen, it destroys it. And this is an extremely difficult to build, hard to build protein. So it doesn't want that to happen. So the legume creates this nodule, the specialized environment. It can pump lots of sugar in there and it can keep it anaerobic so that the nitrogenase isn't injured. So that's what we normally think about. Researchers more recently have found that multi-species called co-inoculation. Co-inoculation with different beneficial species of PGPR actually increased the efficiency of the nitrogen fixation. In this research, they saw a 31% increase compared to the rhizobia alone. And a big part of that is because the Bacillus megatherium that they use is a great phosphate solubilizer. And phosphorus is critical for energy. And this nitrogen fixation is extremely expensive energetically. If you... <laughs> Oh, I was going to say, you know, what you're talking about here, Steve, is is what we've been talking about all day and what Lackey talked about mm -hmm. is diversity, whether we're talking crops, whether we're talking microbial um, inputs within mm -hmm. that soil environment. The diversity is key because they support each other. They're a team. Yeah, we have to have that diversity. Uh, and speaking of diversity, we're not just talking about the organisms that help legumes. Uh, there are also organisms that are known as free-living nitrogen fixers. And these are organisms that have the capacity to build that environment around themselves. They don't need the nodule. They don't have to have that in place to be able to fix the nitrogen. They can protect themselves. So these are organisms that can live on and around the root in the rhizosphere, fix nitrogen, and then again through that rhizophagy, get sucked up, eaten, and then express and release that nitrogen into the plant. One layer deeper are what are known as endophytes. Endo means inside and phyte is plant. So these are organisms that can literally live inside the plant. And we're talking about throughout the entire plant, the leaf, the stem, the root, all throughout. I used to think about these endophytes and kind of assumed, okay, so they're right around the root, they're just on the surface, they're on the edge. But this little call out really kind of highlights how widespread these organisms can be. After making it inside the plant, these organisms can spread throughout the plant. And inside that plant, great environment, less oxygen, so the nitrogenase is protected, as well as a great carbon supply. So we can see incredible outcomes when we start utilizing these nitrogen-fixing bacteria, even in non-leguminous crops. Can't we, Dennis? Yeah, and you know, this is an example uh, in the plus here. Uh, this is uh, spring wheat. These are no-till growers, and one of the things about these no-tills, what are they are trying to achieve, is the fact that they have reached a plateau. They are no longer building soil health, and they wanted to see, you know, why that was and, and what they could do differently in order to build soil health. So much of it has to do with the amount of nitrogen they're using. They're using 80 to 150 pounds of nitrogen in order to get the yields they want in this crop. Mm -hmm. Well, they're burning up all anything they're trying to build based on carbon. Yeah in that soil environment, they're building up. So this was a trial that was done with 20 pounds of nitrogen and the nitrogen fixing bacteria. There were two foliar applications, which again, John will talk about yeah. critical points of influence and how important those are to overall crop yield. And as we've talked about today, the exudates going back into mm -hmm. that soil environment to feed that biology, to help supply this nutrition to this plant. But what we are finding is that they are able to grow with 20 pounds of nitrogen or 30 pounds of nitrogen, very close to the same yielding crop as we could see with the 
180, 150 pounds of nitrogen. And so much of that is important when we start to talk about the regenerative program yeah. and reducing the carbon footprint, reducing uh, contamination to our waterways, which is part of this. Yeah. Um, and where does all that extra nitrogen go? And then really the same thing holds true when we start to talk about phosphorus. Yeah, phosphorus is another one that oftentimes is extremely difficult. People apply and apply and apply phosphorus. Uh, and that's not ideal. We have a limited supply of phosphorus globally. There are only a few countries where 85, 90% of all of our phosphorus comes from. So we've got to use, utilize it more efficiently. And even in the best case scenario under normal growing conditions, normal chemistry tells us that that, that phosphorus is going to bind up with either usually iron, if it's a low pH, or calcium, if it's a fairly high pH. And at best, we've got about 25% of that phosphorus available to the plant on the, the soil solution based on pH, based on normal release. Um, this and, you know, nature, just that little publication, Nature, maybe somebody's heard of that one. Um, but they were looking at phosphate solubilizing bacteria, PSBs, and they found that they nullify the antagonist antagonistic effects of soil calcification on bioavailability of phosphorus in alkaline soils. So what they basically found is having these organisms, even though the calcium has bound up with the phosphorus and we have a tricalcium phosphate, these organisms are able to split that apart. And they're able to do that, which releases both phosphorus and calcium, which is incredible. And they're doing that through mineralization by enzymes as well as solubilization, the enzymes, acid phosphatases, alkaline phosphatases, phytases, and the solubilization through organic acid production, which lowers the pH in those calciferous soils and releases the calcium and the phosphorus at the same time. And this is pretty incredible. Like we talked about those Pseudomonas petita, taking the extra uh, carbon out of the soil and building these little bio pills of it, these phosphate solubilizers know that phosphorus is difficult to access. They know they need it for their DNA. They need it for their phospholipid bilayers that make up all of their cells. They need it for energy. Adenosine triphosphate is phosphorus-based. That's the energy, the battery of the cell. So they know they need it. So they accumulate it. And these little tiny beads, there's a little white spot, a little dark spot. Those are polyphosphate cysts that these bacteria have accumulated so that they can grow even if they're under a phosphorus deficiency. And remember, with that rhizophagy cycle, all these little micro prills of phosphate are now being sucked into the plant and extracted, squeezed out. And the result is a pretty incredible thing, isn't it, Dennis? Yeah, you know, we look at this. This was an indoor grow when we were doing trials on the uh, PSB uh, and looking at this phosphate solubilizing product. And the top here, the control and the treated, both were the exact same plants in the exact same growing meeting, uh, media. Uh, they both had cover off crop applied. They had the same fertilizer. The only thing different was the treated was um, treated with the phosphate solubilizing bacteria. And the amazing part about this is when we start to talk of germination, plant growth, root exudates, soil health, all these things we talk about in regenerative agriculture, we can see how the cover crop has already germinated and started to grow in the treated where in the control, it still has not even germinated yet, mm -hmm. let alone the expression just based on plant size and leaf size yeah. in the treated base of the control. And you see this even further down below in the second two pictures was, was a little bit down the road, um, but it's just amazing what we're seeing based off of the genetic expression of these plants when they have this available phosphorus that they can utilize and this diversity, again, of this bacteria within the soil environment. And this can be carried through out to the field setting. This was an example of Asian pears, which are because you can see them expressing a deficiency here on the left hand side. That was actually a manganese deficiency. Um, the soil pH on this was about an 8.2. It was deficient in manganese and phosphorus. Um, and the grower was ready to take these trees out because of the idea that the fruit that these trees produced was not up to his standard. It was the quality, the flavor, the sizing, none of these things were working out. So he was going to take this block out because he couldn't get it to get this deficiency corrected within these plants. With an application of beneficial bacteria within the soil environment and foliar nutrition, a timely foliar application based off of a... Uh, plant sap analysis, they were able to make the correction of this nutrition. And these are the same trees one month later. 
What I can tell you is this Asian pear block was his higher, highest yield producing and revenue producing block in the orchard uh, last season. And part of this comes down to just based off of nutrition availability. On an A2PH, we understand that's going to be a problem. This microbial community and the rhizophage cycle is making this available to the plant. Well, and this is in a soil that traditional conventional soil analysis show was extremely deficient in manganese to begin with, wasn't it, Dennis? It was, and it still is. But that They're not with expressing the biological, it. they weren't expressing it once they got the nutrition. Just Pretty in, amazing. Just incredible what we can yeah. see. So now we've went through that nutrient cycling, and this is where really things start to happen because as we talk about the importance of healthy plants to put those root exudates into that soil environment to build that carbon, to build that dead microbial biomass, to get that pump, carbon pump cycling, we now can go into improved soil structure. And that really starts with what we look at based on the dreadlocks within the soil. I mean, I was talking about soil pH being an issue on those Asian pears. One of the things about this is this biology creates a home that it wants to live in. Yeah. And in that home, it wants, as I said, food, shelter, water, um, all the things that it needs in order to support itself, oxygen, but it also needs a pH. Mm -hmm. And we may have had a pH of an 8-2 with those Asian pears, but this biology is going to change that pH within their home significantly up to two full points. points two full points which is unbelievable which helps not only in the digestion process for that microbial home and soil health building but also nutrient availability so to build that these microbes have a pretty incredible capacity we talked a little bit about creating that environment for nitrogen fixation and a big part of how these microbes are doing that is they're producing what are known as extracellular polysaccharides EPSs or mucilaginous polysaccharides. They're sugars. They're fancy sugars is basically what they are. So these microbes are taking individual soil particles and then they're gluing them together with these uh, extracellular polysaccharides. I mean, this is, a, this is the idea of a biofilm. You know, you go out to your water tank and you kind of feel the side and it's all slimy. That's those microbes creating the home that they want. They glue those individual soil particles together through these EPSs and biofilms, and that creates individual soil particles that are stuck together, and now we have microaggregate. Microaggregates are forming, and that increases gas exchange, water storage, and it allows that soil to start to build. The next stage is, after these microbes have glued together individual soil particles, is we have the, the mycelium and fungal hyphae that are starting to weave those individual microaggregates together into larger aggregates. And these larger aggregates um, allow us to see the macro aggregates, the larger ones. These are the ones that we can actually kind of start seeing. Uh, and research has shown that mycorrhizal fungi are great at this, and they produce a molecule known as glomalin, which is extremely resilient. Researchers have found that it can last for decades in the soil. So as we're building these communities and utilizing the bacteria to make the microaggregates, and these bacteria can also be mycorrhizae helper bacteria to help these mycorrhizae establish and feed the plant and help bind that soil together. So as these microbes are binding these individual soil particles together, like the biofilm, that's carbon, that's sugar, that's extracellular polysaccharide. So it's coating these uh, individual soil particles with carbon. And this carbon has a very high CEC, cation exchange capacity. So the soil, now that it's being held together, can actually hold more nutrients. Rather than nutrient flushing through, we see nutrient holding as well, which gets into water holding. So here we can see a completely bare soil, massive erosion. Nobody's doing that in this group, I hope, and I expect since we're a regenerative ag group. And as we transition up to some field armor, heavy amounts of passive armor, and then at the very top end, we have this level of active growing root. And we can watch as we have reduced erosion, reduced amount of loss of carbon, this dark color is carbon nutrition that's being lost. And we see increased infiltration, better water storage, and cleaner water, which means that that soil is now holding on to more nutrition as we maximize that profile with these microbes creating that soil structure. And then we move right into improved water availability. Mm -hmm. And it is so critical to how important this whole process of the stair-step ladder is. And when we get to that improved soil structure and we get to the improved, suddenly we have better crops, we have more root exudates. This 
there's an explosion of this entire process within that soil environment. And here's where we start to get our resiliency within yeah. that soil. Some of what Lackey was talking about mm -hmm. based off of what regenerative agriculture is buffer. all about. It's, it's a, a buffer. major buffer. Yeah, absolutely. So we think about water, water, water everywhere, but not a drop drink. Yeah, no, that's really the case. The world is covered by 70% of the Earth's surface, roughly, is covered in water. But the reality is 1%, approximately 1% of that water is available as liquid fresh water. And even a smaller fraction, here we can see 0.05% is available in the soil for the plants and farmers. We are having global droughts. So we've got to really maximize everything we can to increase that organic. We've got to bind and knit that soil together. We've got to use those microbes, uh, those PGPR, to create that structure. Because we, as we increase organic matter 18 to 20 times, its weight will be held in water. And that helps recycle nutrients and hold it. 1% has been shown to hold 27,000 gallons of water. So as we're moving into this climate change uh, and global catastrophes, we've got to maximize our organic carbon, don't we, Dennis? Yeah, some of the research that we've been seeing, like at Cornell University and Washington State University, and, and a lot what Dr. Hatfield spent his life doing was the climate change conundrum, lower yields or revenue instability, as this article was referred to as. So the idea here is to uh, produce seeds that are more drought tolerant. And, you know, I kind of look at that and yes, we need better seeds. No question about it. Well, we cannot ignore our soils no. and how we manage that soil to get through these drought stresses. And Bruce found that a long time ago. And what hit, led him down the path of this biological community was he was not creating hardier plants. He was creating healthier insects and disease. And it all starts with our soil health. So how do we biology help us get through those stress periods? The abiotic stress or drought. This picture here, you can see the control on the left is alfalfa. This was the grower's best field. The one treated on the right used to be his worst field. This was based on excessive sodium levels that were being pumped into the field out of the well. Mm -hmm. And so by dealing with this, with diversity of a biological inoculum, we're able to deal with that abiotic stress and to tie up that sodium. So yeah, what these microbes are doing, these PGPR around the root, create an entirely different response by the plant. So here we can see that by having these PGPR, we actually allow the plant to move more of that sodium that's causing this issue down and out to the root. The microbes down there say, no, I don't want that. So we talked about the EPS, this is the extracellular polysaccharides. The microbes can actually take that sodium that's being spat out and weave it into the soil matrix, weave it into those extracellular polysaccharides and leave it as part of that structure, decreasing the sodium's effect on the plant and the soil, as well as a whole bunch of other uh, impacts that we don't really have time to talk about. Increased water conductance, so they're able to move more water, hold on to more nutrition, a better balance of potassium to sodium so we can open and close the stomata, as well as many other benefits associated with yield and photosynthesis. This, this was a, a test that we did years ago that was a lot of fun. And I mean, when we talk about desert, Green the Desert was the name of the project. This was literally desert. This is outside of Dubai. This is sand. And the water that they had there was salt. This was worst case scenario, pure sand, salty water. Uh, to try to counteract the fact that this was pretty much pure sand, they used a good amount of humate and a good amount of biochar. We had to have some carbon to start this process. And you can see the before here. So the difference is they started inoculating with these uh, abiotic stress PGPR. And after, is this normal yield? No. It's not a normal yield, but this went from no yield dead plants to actually being able to grow plants in this environment. So yeah, Dennis, you mentioned that genetic, genetics are important, but utilizing what we've already got and maximizing that output is critical. And as we talk about all the time, it's a program. Yeah. It's not a product, it's a program of all these things coming together, just like regenerative agriculture, yes. to truly build soil health. Yeah, it's, it's a system, it's a program, it's not any individual thing. So I like, I want to end on kind of this last little fun story. And the idea here is making friends. I mentioned co-inoculation earlier, but the idea here is as we increase diversity, we increase the capacity of that soil to do unbelievable things. Uh, in this case, the researcher were using Peony bacillus vortex, which is a communal organism. It grows in swarms 
It's almost like it communicates. It moves around in the soil and moves around looking for nutrition. But these, are my, these microbes are tiny. One micron, if they run into even a small gap, they have no way of making it across that gap in the soil environment. So what the researchers found is these little microbes, they have what are known as cilia. They're like little hairs that are on their back, and they kind of use them like arms. They entangle Aspergillus fumigatus spores, and they carry them around with them. I kind of think about them like little, little, um, <laughs> yeah, little Boy Scouts just running around the environment having fun exploring. And they come to this. What do they do? They drop those spores, encourage the spores to grow and establish, and then the fungal mycelia, the hyphae, are able to grow across this gap, and then these bacteria can grow along that bridge. Unbelievably cool, unbelievably incredible, but we can only get there if we have diversity. If our practices are utilizing a lot of anti-fungicides, uh, fung anti-fungal um, practices and properties, these can't do it. So this isn't a one plus one equals two scenario. As we're building these regenerative practices, just like the stair step, we see bigger and bigger. So the shape of that stairs kind of gets smaller as you go up. I think the reality is that bacterial larger. community is critical. That is the base of the pyramid. We have to have it start the ball rolling. But once we get there, those visible outcomes can be incredible. So, I mean, my sum up here is we've got to maximize our practices. We've got to focus, like Dennis said, what have we done in the past? We've got to focus on our management. We have to build this community. We've got to support the community around us to make sure that we have a maximum um, potential for our crops. And John's going to come in and tell us a bit how to do that, how to maximize that efficiency, how to maximize photosynthesis to make that system work. Yeah, and it, you know, it's important, of, of, as I was saying earlier, every of along every step of the way of the stair step process, mm -hmm. biology is important. And we really can never forget that biological component within that soil environment as we do all these other things in regenerative agriculture. We all, I often tell growers, if we have to do something to our soil and we know it's either going to be a positive or negative effect on our beneficial bacteria, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. either on our plant or within our soil, yeah. we need to know what we need to do yeah. to fix it. Yeah. And that's something we can talk about another time. I, With I, that, thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you, everybody. We had a lot of fun, and hopefully you did as well. Ask us some questions once we uh, once we keep this ball a rolling. And uh, thank you, Rochelle. We're going to hand it over to you. All right. Thanks, guys. Love the energy, all that beautiful information that you put out there. Thanks so much.